Thank you very much, everyone. And um, now I'll be turning the meeting over to our speakers for tonight, um, continuing our workshop on the five big delusions of uh, alcoholism. Um, Jimmy, Jimmy A from uh, New Jersey and Harold L from St. Louis, Missouri. Well, hey everybody, my name's Harold, I'm an alcoholic. Can you hear me? Yes, all right, great. Well, it's great to be here with you. Uh, my sobriety date's April 7th, 1987. My home group is in St. Louis. It's going on right now. It's called AA on the Rocks. Uh, and a strong three legacy group right in the city. If you're ever in St. Louis, you know, look us up. And especially on a Wednesday night, we'd love to uh, put you to work. If you get a hold of us quick enough, I promise you, we'll put you to work somehow, some way in, in, in big mo to share your experience, strength, and hope. But it's uh, great to be here. I come from a great line of sponsorship. It's all, all those things that I just lifted up made a big difference in how my life has turned out. I'm not in St. Louis tonight. I'm in Morrisonville, or I'm in Morrison, not Morrisonville, but Morrison, Colorado. Um, and normally I would fly a flag. That's what we call wearing a tie, but I forgot to bring a flag with me to Morrison. So I'm, I'm, I'm off the hook. I'm letting myself off the hook tonight. Uh, but I am here with you. And the reason I'm out here is because we're out here because our daughter's giving birth to our first grandson anytime now. And she's at the hospital right now. Her name is Danielle. Her husband's name is Sam. And his baby's name is going to be Anna. And uh, so she's going through all the preparation to be induced. And uh, I think they give her the real stuff about 2 o'clock in the morning. So somewhere probably after midnight tomorrow, we'll have our first little grandchild in, in, in town. So be praying. If you're a prayer warrior, please put Danielle, Sam, and Anna on your prayer list. I would greatly appreciate that. Um, now, they, at the same time they found out they were pregnant, they took in two foster children and, um, and, and not really in a foster role. They just took them because they didn't, they needed a place, a safe place to go. And so that was Damien and uh, Jane. Damien is three and Jane's just getting ready to turn five. So I have that duty. My wife and I, Susie, have the duty of watching Damien and Jane. And uh, since they are underdeveloped for their age, uh, they're coming along, but Jane had a hard time saying Harold, so she nicknamed me. Well, I don't call it a nickname. I think she it's concrete now, but she calls me Grandpa Harry. So that's what I've been hearing all day long is Grandpa Harry. And uh, and so, it, uh, so yeah, I'm pretty wore out because I've had nothing but, uh, you know, World Wrestling Federation matches with these kids all day. So anyway, but it's great to be here. That's where I'm at. And it's a, it's a good way to live. And so if, if you're here for the first time, you weren't here last week, welcome to the workshop uh, that we call Five Big Delusions of Alcoholism. There's a lot more than five delusions, don't get us wrong, but just from a, you know, from a framework to frame it, this is how it came. How did the workshop come about? It came out of the Department of Corrections some years ago back in the 90s, uh, doing PI and CPC work, if you wanna call it that, corrections work with uh, Probation and Parole Board of Eastern Area, Missouri. And they asked us to come and educate their probation and parole officers how to be more effective, how to better understand their alcoholic parolee, and how to better understand the alcoholic alcoholism, period. And so out of that, you know, this this workshop got, at least it got started, it got framed, and over over time it's just kind of come together. Um, and then COVID hit, and and some people asked us to do it live, and it's just, it's, and so I invited Jimmy to do it with me, and so this is, I think, the third time or fourth time, I don't know, somewhere in there. Um, that we've done this workshop together. And so last week we started off, so I just want to give you the five big delusions because typically we do it in five weeks, five weeks, five sessions and about two hour sessions. We're doing it in four and even in a shorter amount of period of time. But I want to give you all five and then, we'll, and then and we're going to talk about two of them tonight, one more next week and then the last week we'll finish off. But the first delusion is I'm not alcoholic, right? And that's what we talked about last night at length and in our last, last week. And it's that delusion that destroys most alcoholics. I'm not what you say that I am. I'm not what all the evidence says that I am. And it's that delusion that somehow I can drink like other people without problems, that somehow or another I'll, I'll figure it out um, before I burn my life into the ground. It's that delusion that destroys most of us. So for all of us that are here tonight and have come to grips with that delusion, have, have conceded to our innermost self that we're alcoholic, then praise our higher power for that. Uh, because just having the desire not to drink and, and wrapping our arms around that and embracing that is a tremendous gift. And, and it's something that we should cherish and hang on to with everything we have, because if it ever slips through our fingers um, and we would fall back into uh, our dark patterns and drink again, um, there's no guarantee we'd ever draw a sober breath again. 
So it's re- that delusion, number one, it, it's so imperative that we, we wrap our mind around it. So I'm grateful I did that. And we talked at length about that. So we're really not going to get into that one too much, but I just want to bring it up. Delusion number two is that we finally get to a place we can see that we're alcoholic, but we get to a place where, you know, I am alcoholic, but let's just be real. It's not my fault. You know, it's victimization. So we're going to talk about that big time tonight. And then the third delusion is that, you know, yes, I'm an alcoholic. I'll take full responsibility for my life, but let's just be real. I burnt my life too far underground. I broke too many hearts. I burnt too many bridges. The mountain's too big to climb. The impossible, it's impossible for the possible. It's, it's impossible for my life to ever be resurrected or to turn around or, or to amount to anything. The, the value of time is a factor. And so let's just be real with each other. And that delusion's very critical. And we'll talk about that one. So those two are what we're going to talk about tonight. Delusion number four, spiritual disqualification. We'll get into that next week. And then delusion number five, there's no real concrete purpose for my life. There's no real purpose for, for my life outside of not drinking. And so those are what we frame that into. All right. So tonight we're going to talk about delusion number two. And so finally I was able to come to AA and I told you that story last week. And I told you I came to AA, and if you're new, and I know we have some treatment centers or halfway houses or three-quarter houses or even sober living environments with us tonight. So welcome to all you guys. Um, and uh, so my first three years of sobriety is about as much what not to do as to do. And I'm being totally transparent with you. So I came to AA the same way I did everything else in my life on self-propulsion. I'm going to do what I want, how I want, when I want, the way I want. And if you don't like it, man, too bad for you because that's how I'm doing it. And that's how I came to AA. Maybe that's how you came to AA. But I came here like that. And I came with a desire not to drink. Thank God I finally got to that. I was introduced to AA in 1979 in the Department of Corrections. Uh, went to my first treatment center in 1980. You know, it was an adequate demonstration, but I rejected, you know, what they had to offer me and drank for seven more years and finally surrendered. Uh, and, you know, I found God in the, in the jail cell floors where I found God. And uh, in 1987, I've been with you people since. But those first three years, you know, was it was everything I could do just to get here, just to come to AA. But I finally came, and, and I came with this desire not to drink. I didn't come with a desire to have a relationship with God. I didn't have come with a desire to, to adopt 12 spiritual principles as a way of living um, or this design for living because I just didn't think it would work for me. It's the bottom line. I, I didn't know what to expect when I got here. I just knew I didn't want to drink anymore. I really wasn't sold out for doing AA or going to meetings for the rest of my life. Nothing about that got me excited, but I came here and I loved you people. I mean, how can you not? I mean, look at y'all. You guys are awesome. And uh, the personalities and, and everybody that's here, it's just beautiful. So I got here, I came down to Alcoholics Anonymous and I came in that way. And so I came in with that rotten attitude and I didn't want a sponsor. I had a sponsor and I had a, a probation or pro officer my entire life. So I wasn't interested in any, any other authority figures in my life or anybody having say so in my life. And so that's how I came here. And, uh, and so I, I was on step none for the first three years I was here. You could argue I was on point five. I did have a sincere desire not to drink. And I was heavily involved in the fellowship over time. I, I was a rock and roll drummer my whole life. I had a sober band right off the bat called Alliance. Played on sober softball teams. Got into sober dancing. You know, big dances were a thing back in the 80s. That's when MC Hammer and, and all that stuff was out. And, and uh, I got into all that stuff, believe it or not. I know, I know a hillbilly from Missouri. It's hard to believe that a country boy from Missouri would get into all that. But I was into all this fellowship stuff. And, if you, and I was everywhere. So if you, if you saw me, you thought I was running for office or something. Here. I was just everywhere. Ultimately, because I didn't believe that it was going to change my life. And, uh, and so, that's how, that, so for the first three years, I just, that's what I did. I stayed sober on Fellowship A. But what I'm telling you is you can only live like that for so long. And it ultimately, I mean, it's long, when you take king alcohol out of your life, your life's going to get better physically to, to some degree. You're mentally going to clear up a little bit. You're going to get, you know, emotionally, you're going to clear up just a little bit and, and, and maybe even a little bit spiritually. But, but for the most part, you're going you're gonna to plateau pretty quick. And, and, and then the root of what this thing's all about is really going to rear its ugly head in your life. And that's what happened to me. And so I grinded it out for the first three years. But I finally come to the end of myself. And what I will tell you from my own experience in sponsoring hundreds of guys over the last 34 years is you have to come to the end of yourself. For some of you, that will be the moment you put down King Alcohol and you come in and you come all the way in and you sit all the way down and you stay here and you just get right into this thing and you jump full feet and hats off to you. But that's not the case for so many of us. And that was my case. 
And so I came here. And, and so finally, after three years of being here, I finally got enough pain and, 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 a, and a dark enough place that I finally humbled myself for sponsorship. And I went to and asked this guy named Roy to sponsor me. He knew me my whole sobriety. I was, this is 1990 now, going into 1990. So I've been here for three years already. <clears throat> and I went to Roy and I said, Roy, will you sponsor me? He said, sure. Let's come over to my house and let's talk about it. And so we sat down at his kitchen table. He said, well, Harold, you've been here now for almost three years. Tell me about your life. And in a real quick synopsis, I said, Roy, you know, here's where I'm at. I'm 25 years old. I got, I live right down the street from you in the basement of a house. I don't have a legal driver's license. I've never had a legal driver's license. I got a criminal record. I don't have any education. I don't even have GED. I got a piece of crap car out here that I, that I drive that's held together by bumper stickers that I can't legally drive, but I do anyway. I said, Roy, my life sucks every which way you take it. Just take the word sucks. You can put it in all capital letters, highlight it, italicize it, underline it. I don't care what you do with it. You can make a neon sign out of it and flash it. Sucks, sucks, sucks. This is where my life was at. And I hadn't drank in three years. And so he gracefully listened to all that. But what he would say next is ultimately help change my life. And this is what he said to me. He said, Harold, I hear everything you're saying to me. I know your story. I know where you came from. And there's no doubt that you've been dealt a tough hand in life. No question about it. That you've been dealt a tough hand. But I really hope you're going to hear what I'm going to tell you because it's the truth. And friends, if you're listening tonight, what I tell you is it, what he told me that night is as true today on January 12, 2022, as it was on that day. And this is what he said to me. He said, Harold, every single thing you got going on in your life right now, sitting at my kitchen table, every single thing you got going on, you've attracted that to you. You've attracted that to you by the person that you've become. And the day you're man enough to own that is the day you're on your way to some real change. But until you can own that, just take full ownership for that. You're going to do what my dad did. My dad was an alcoholic, could never get sober. My dad took his life. So you're going to do, you're going to go the, the same route your dad went, or you're going to go drink again. I know you don't think so because you're, you seem, you think you're happy about your sobriety. You, you, and to some, some degree, you think you got a handle on it, but I'm telling you, you're not happy about what your life and you're eventually you're going to drink again. And uh, so you're going to do one or two things. You're either going to grow or you're going to go. And the million dollar question is, what do you want to do? And that's a question that every single one of us have to come to grips with in our life. We all have to come to the end of ourselves and we all got to face that big question. We're either going to grow or we're going to go. So what's our, our decision? Well, I didn't want to go. And I had enough friends here and enough investment here that I didn't want to leave. But, but I knew he was going to say, let's work the steps. And I just didn't believe the steps would change my life. You know, the late Clancy would say it all the time that the hardest thing that any of us will ever do, any of us, is to take actions that we don't believe in. And I just didn't believe that 12 steps would change my life. I didn't, I didn't understand how taking a, a moral inventory of my life and then sharing my entire life with another human being, taking a, a really hard look at my grosser handicaps and then, and, and then making a list of all the people that harm what seemed like an endless list and then being willing to confront that and reconcile with that. You know, it just didn't make any sense how that was going to change my life. I had too much world in me. In, in, in this world, you know, it tries to shape how each and every one of us live our life. And we talked about that delusion last week, which is the underlying delusion of all of this, and that delusion of inequality, that I'm not enough in this world that we live in tries to shape who we are, what we drive, what we wear, where we live, how much money we make, what we do, what we listen to, what we watch on TV. It tries to shape us. It tries to put labels all over us. And it, it does that long before we ever pick up a drink. Well, I had all these labels on me, and that was that I was a knucklehead, I was a failure, I was a failure, a felon, I was a criminal. I mean, going down the line, I had all these things stuck to me in my life. And, uh, and, and, and so that's what I, how I saw myself. And, and, and I didn't see myself as a child of God. I saw myself as a, you know, a, a, a pathetic alcoholic, really, in the big scheme of things. I knew I was a knucklehead. I knew the, the hearts I broke. I knew the things I did. And, uh, and I just didn't think that that, that was going to change it. To me, to be happy and joyous and free, call me crazy, but I think if I had a few hundred dollars in my pocket, I could be a little bit happy, joyous, and free. That was my mindset. Give me a better-looking girl or a girl at all, and I could be truly happy, joyous, and free. 
Give me a legal driver's license and a decent job and a place to live, for God's sake. Give me that. And I think I could be a little bit like you. I could be a little bit more happy, joyous, and free. And that is delusional thinking, and it's all right. It's that delusion. Bill talks about it on page 61. Then we rest satisfaction. Then we're under delusion that we can rest satisfaction out of this world if we can only manage it well. This delusion that somehow or not I'm just going to figure it all out. And that delusion plagues all of us. But the, the culture we live in here in the West with all the individualism and the materialism and the consumerism and the secularism, all this stuff that's trying to shape us into who we're supposed to be. And none of us can measure up to that and fail miserably. And if that becomes our higher power, you know, it, it's a it's a hopeless trade. We're just chasing our tail. It's we have moments of what I would call very temporal moments of peace. And then we're right back into, you know, irritable, restless, and discontent. And so, you know, so the idea that, and so, and it gives us the formula for this on page 64. It says, when we put the spiritual ahead of the material, we straighten out physically, we straighten out mentally, we straighten out emotionally, go on down the line. We finally straighten out when we get the, the mathematics right. And I call it spiritual mathematics. What do I mean by that? Well, spiritual mathematics means that two plus two doesn't equal four. And it means the impossible can become possible. But not until we get the channel clear. And so, and so we don't create the channel. The channel's there. The channel's the spirit of God, which the book tells us deep down inside us. And we'll talk about the channel a lot here. But, you know, but the, the channel was definitely clogged with booze. But then you get the booze out of the channel, and you still got a clogged channel. You got a channel that's full of junk, resentments, conflicts, fears, secrets, sex stuff. I mean, going down the line. All these labels, all this delusion of inequality, all this stuff shoved into this channel. There wasn't anything getting through here. And this is my problem. This is what blocked me off. This is what led me to, to, to just be shaped by the shame and the guilt and the remorse and, and what I thought you thought of me and the world thought of me and all that stuff shaped me. So when the sponsor says, well, we're going to work these steps and it's going to change your life, I was like, it's just hard for me to get on board with that. But I want to tell you, in my experience, in 34 years of being here, and from my own personal experience and working the steps with literally hundreds of guys over the last 34 years, it, until your life depends on it, until you come to the end of yourself, will you really lean into this? What we're going to talk about tonight and the rest of the time we're here in the next three weeks. And so th this is what I want to get into tonight. So and it's called the delusion of victimization. It's where I finally got to. You know, I sat at Roy's table and said, you know, Roy, basically I was saying, Roy, I'm an alcoholic, but it's really not all my fault. I maybe took a little bit of responsibility for it, but the reality was I took very little. And, our, and step four tells us to, to, to conclude that others was wrong is about as far as most of us ever got. And that's such a true statement. I'm such a textbook AA drunk. I mean, to the T, when it says this, it fits me like a glove all the way through that book, cover to cover. But that was me. I had a blame list a mile long, as long as the Mississippi River runs right in front of the Gateway Arch, of why my life was messed up. How far does blame go back? Well, if you chase it back through history, it goes all the way back to the man blamed the woman and the woman blamed the serpent. That's how far blame goes back. It goes back a long way. So it's got a huge history. And it had, its, it had its grip of death around my throat. And, here's, and it's called victimization. Here's the problem with victimization, is that you can drink yourself to death and it's not your fault. You can blow your nostrils out. You can blow your veins out. You can blow your lungs out, man. You can blow your brains out, and it's not your fault. You can sit in a nine by six or ten by or nine by seven or ten by six jail cell for the rest of your life, and it's not your fault. And that victimization is a deadly card. And I can promise you, there's plenty of people that are on here that are playing it right now. They got that card, and man, I hung on to it with dear life. And I felt so justified. And don't get me wrong, there are as many of you here that suffered some really heavy trauma. There's people here that were sexually abused, physically abused, verbally abused, spiritually abused, and abused in ways you don't even want to hear about. It, it would just break your heart to hear some of the stories that are on here right now. And so I had some of those stories. I grew up with a single mom on the streets, grew up on the streets by the age of 10 and going and coming as I pleased. You know, run around with people I had no business running around with at that young age and suffered sexual abuse, physical abuse, verbal abuse, all the stuff before I was even old enough to drive a car. And so I came here with all that junk, all that baggage, all that stuff. 
my 150 poor, my 150 pound bag of poo I drug right in here. And so I laid it out here, you know, and, and this, this stuff had my channel completely clogged. I wasn't, I wasn't going to get past this channel, this victimization. And so we start this inventory and this inventory right off the bat, we get into that first column that says resentments. If that doesn't work for you, change it out, interchange it and just replace it with conflicts. Cause that's what my sponsor had me do because resentment wasn't even a part of my vocabulary being a country boy, being a Hoosier from the, from the, the country hills, the Ozark Mountains. It just wasn't a word that was in my vocabulary. So Swan said, well, just toss it and replace it with conflicts. You ever had any conflicts, Harold? I said my whole life, that's it. Let's talk about your conflict. And so we started writing it down. And, you know, it was an exhaustive list. And what happened and how it affected me. But I was really good at that stuff. But then we get into this part that's really hard that we, we push all that aside. And now we're going to take the focus and put it on us. The spotlight's going to be on you and me. What part did I play? I ain't never done this inventory like this in my life, much less start to put the spotlight on me and take ownership of my life. But I'm going to tell you, it's what set me free. It's what helped start to clear this channel in my life and uh, to take ownership of my life. Because this is how deep the delusion goes. My sponsor's sitting there with that inventory, and I'm sitting in this house with a yellow notebook pad and a pencil. I don't even know how to get this thing started, even though I got an example right there in the book how to do it. He's like, here, well, let's just start with your dad. I said, well, I don't have no beef with my dad. And I said, well, look, the, the, the last time you saw your dad, you were 14 years old. You were being sentenced to the penitentiary at, at 14. You know, what do you mean you don't have no beef with your dad? He was never in your life. You only saw him a handful of times. He was dead two years before you ever knew he was dead. So what do you mean you don't have no beef with your dad? This is how deep the delusion is. I don't know. I don't even think I got a, a deal here. But when, when I time I started writing and I started looking at that, guess what I discovered? I, I discovered a great big hole in my soul, in my soul, and it was in the shape of a dad. It was a huge, huge cavity in my life, but the, I couldn't even see it. I didn't want to see it. And when I got pressed on it, it's like, well, Harold, did you ever make up lies about your dad? And when I got honest about that, it's like, yeah, all the time, especially as a young kid. Where's your dad at? Well, he's in the army. He's in the war. He's just, you know, I didn't even know where he was at. So th this is what I mean about the delusion. We don't see ourselves. And in our book, even tells us fancy to real, this stuff has the power to kill you. Joe Walsh wrote a great song, Living a Life of Illusion. I mean, and that's what I was. I mean, when I got done with my inventory, friends, a third of my life was nothing but illusion and the actions that I took based off this twisted perception of who I was and who you were and who they were uh, was based in delusion, illusion. And victimization was a big part of that. And it was a huge part of it, absolutely huge. And, and so taking ownership for that for the first time in my life um, and having a great sponsor to help me do it and then doing countless inventories from that day forward have cleared that channel. And it changed my life. And I, I was finally able to toss that, that victim card. Um, and when I did, my life started to change. So my Tom, my sponsor was Tom, Tom I. Some of you know Tom from North Carolina. Tom was my sponsor most of my sobriety. He's still alive, going to be 64 years sober on Groundhog's Day. And, uh, but he's got, you know, he's got Alzheimer's and dementia today. He's in a nursing home. So he's not in the capacity to sponsor. But he'll be my sponsor until he goes to the big meeting in the sky. But Tom had this quote that he always used to, to lay out to folks. And, this is what the quote said, and I, and I hope you hang on to it because it's really powerful. And what he said was this, when preparation meets opportunity and God does the introduction, great things can happen in your life. But if, you, but if you're not prepared for the opportunities, they will pass you by. And, and when you take king alcohol out of your life and you're not acting like a fool, at least as much as you were, you're going to have opportunities, but you're not going to be prepared emotional, emotionally prepared, spiritually mature enough to, to live into them. So they will pass you by. And because of the delusion that I'm not good enough for these opportunities, that I'm not smart enough for these opportunities, that I'm burnt too many bridges and broke too many hearts, and I got this ugly record, I got this ugly past. And, and be honest with you, a lot of it's just flat evil. Now, what good can even come out of that? This is the stuff that shaped who I was as I sat in this table and started this journey through the steps. And it was by... I share my entire life story with another human being, as step five would say, that this channel got 
get a little bit clearer for the first time. When you took the channel and you shake out the resentments and you start to shake out the sex stuff and you shake out the crimes that I committed that I never got caught for, you start to shake this stuff out of the tube, your channel starts to get clear and, and, and things start to change in your life. Your perception of yourself and the world starts to change. And nothing really changes. It's just your attitude starts to change. Your perceptions start to get cleared up. And you start to have this spiritual experience, which is what we all need if we're going to stay here. It's what we all need if we're really going to live the life that we were created to live. But this victimization, friends, it's, it's heavy stuff. And I know some of you got heavy junk, and you're hanging on to it for dear life. <clears throat> you're hanging on to it. There's people that are just on disability that are incapacity because of victimization. And they have been for years and years and years. There's just people that are just sitting in prison, sitting in a lot of places they're on the streets and they're stuck in this victim. They will not let go of this victim card. I'm here because of you. I'm here because of them. And you know what I'm talking about. And friends, that is a, that's a heavy place to be. And it seems, why would I want to get rid of that victim card if you've done this to me? Why would I want to do that? But that's where the freedom comes. You know, when we get to this place of forgiveness, you know, as the old saying goes, when we forgive somebody, we set a prisoner free. The prisoner's who? It's, it's me. It's you. And so, but we, but we have to get to that space, and this inventory really helps us do that. So steps four and five are just imperative to get past this victimization. But it leads right into this third delusion, because even after that work, even after I toss that, that, that victim card, even as I started to take ownership from my life, I still had this delusion of impossibility. It's impossible for my life to ever really change. I mean, come on, let's just be real with each other. I'm a convicted felon. I don't have any education. I don't have a GD. I don't have a driver's license. I don't have nothing. So how's my life ever going to amount to anything? And the older you are when you get here. So I was 21 going on 22 when I got sober. But the older you are when you get here, the harder this delusion becomes because then you got to factor in the, the time value of time. So time has passed me by. There's too much time. I'm 40 years old. I'm 50 years old. I'm 60 years old. I burnt my life into the ground. Let's just be transparent. <clears throat> Let's just be real with each other. There's, there's not enough time for me to recreate my life, for me to be reborn and for this life to mean anything. And so when that attitude, when that gets into your mind, and more importantly, when it gets into the meat of your soul, well, it leads to discouragement. And once you've got a, a soul full of discouragement, guess what you do? You quit. You don't even get started, friends. You quit. That's why we have a recidivism rate of 60, 70 percent in the United States, because people are already given up before they walk out of prison because of this delusion that I'm talking about. My life is over. Let's just be real. It's over with. Well, as much as I didn't want to drink, as much as I wanted to be happy, joyous, and free and have a sober life, this is what plagued me. You know, I'm already 25 years old, man. I mean, come on. What, you know, I'm 25. I don't have nothing. Zero, nothing going on in my life. And so as a process of working these steps and then following the dictates of a higher power and sponsorship, things started to happen. When I really started living to the steps, two plus two didn't equal four anymore. The impossible started to become possible and my life started to change. And it's tasted so good that I've never stopped from that day till now. And that is a tremendous promise for you. So wherever you're at on your spiritual journey, wherever you're at on this road to recovery, and you're sitting here tonight going, man, I totally identify with that dude. Everything he's saying is right on track. I'm telling you, it's delusional. Just like the delusion that, that I can't get sober, that seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. You know, it's the word seemingly. It's not reality that I can't change my life, that I can't, you know, recover from alcoholism, but it seems that way. It's, again, it's part of that delusion. Well, it's the same way with this part of our life, that seemingly impossibility for my life to ever amount to anything but if you've been here long enough you've watched the impossible become possible so many times you can't count i call it holy anticipation especially going into the prisons and the treatment centers and my home group and the guys that i work with that who just got all this mess they're bringing into the door i've watched the impossible become possible for so many people i couldn't even begin to tell you and many people on the screen tonight and so what how did that all change for me as i started to, to mature as i started to grow as i started to get responsible and i and I was willing to take whatever came my way and work my way up. I finally got an opportunity after reconciling with my mom, after being here almost three and a half, four years, I reconciled with my mom finally through the eighth and ninth step work. And, uh, and she had recreated her life throughout her broken life. And, 
and uh, and offered me an opportunity to get the, to come work in what she was doing. And I said, and, and she worked for a major corporation. I said, well, Mom, that's all great that you want to do that, but let's just be real with me. They're not going to hire a dude like me. And she goes, let me worry about that. And so she got me a job working for her, not for the company, but working for her for a year. And after a year, they gave me an opportunity. And I can remember going into the interview to, to get into this full-time job. I had to borrow a tie from the guy next door. And I went into this interview, and the guy said, the guy's name was Art Johnson. He was the president of this company. And he says, Harold, the only reason you're sitting here is because of your mom. I just want you to know that. That's the only reason you're here. But I want to tell you, if we do hire you, there's three things you're going to do. You're going to work hard, you're going to work smart, and you're going to work honest. And if you don't do one of those three, you won't be here any longer. Are we clear on that? I said, yes, sir. Well, they gave me the break, and I made the most of it. And I did exactly what that guy told me to do. I worked hard, I worked smart, and I worked honest. And I started to have an amazing career, but I plateaued, and I eventually couldn't go any further. And so eventually, now I'm in my 30s. I'm double-digit sober now. 12 years sober. And I'm at a plateau. I can't go anywhere. I don't have any education. My sponsor says, well, I, you need to go get your GED. And I said, I just got to be transparent with you. I can't pass a GED. I quit school when I was 13 years old. I tried a couple times incarcerated and got discouraged and quit. He says, well, then go sign up for courses. And, and so this is where my pride immediately rushed in. Well, I'm already successful. I've, I've got a good living. I've got kids. I've got a wife. I'm, my life's taken off. But he said, just go sign up. So I signed up for a community college for 16 weeks to take this GED course. And I went, and they thought I was the instructor when I got there, when I walked in, because I started, already had gray hair going. They thought I was going to teach the class. It was crazy. I could tell you some funny stories, and I have time. Long story short, I finished the 16 weeks and took the GED and passed it. And I did well enough that I got some opportunities to go to college, and eventually walked across the stage and got a bachelor's degree and sent my mom a bumper sticker that said, hey, your kid made the honor roll. You know, I'm 37 years old. It was a big joke in my family. But the impossible started to become possible in my life. And eventually I walk across the stage and I get a master's degree in business. And I wrote my thesis on starting a business from scratch and selling it. And I did that not once, but twice in my sobriety. And ultimately walk across the stage and get another master's degree. So what I'm telling you is the impossible becomes possible. And life can happen. You know, I'm my wife, I got five kids, and I'm out here with the one that was just I can remember when they handed me the one that's getting ready to have her baby. I remember when they handed her to me and, and they said, here you go. And I didn't know I could fall in love with a little bald headed woman with no teeth. You know, I didn't know I could do it, but they handed me one and here I got this little bald headed woman with no teeth and I totally fell in love with her. And she's at the hospital right now giving birth to another little bald headed woman with no teeth. It's a great deal. It's a great life. I wouldn't have any of it, obviously, if I wasn't sober, but I promise you, I wouldn't ever have any of it. I couldn't have tossed that victim and quit buying the delusion that it's too late for a guy like me, that I burnt my life too far underground. I broke too many hearts for my life ever to change. And if you're there, which I know some of you are, it's delusional at best. I don't care how old you are. I can remember being at the Minneapolis International. So whenever we were in Minneapolis, and I remember a lady coming across that stage at the old timers meeting. I think she was 85 years sober. And she came up and she goes, I'm 85. I just got my master's. And 60,000 people went nuts, man. If you were there, it was unbelievable. It was, it was, it was unbelievable. And that's what I'm saying. I've watched the impossible become possible. So wherever you're at again on your recovery journey, you're going to have to deal with this channel. You're going to have to deal with the junk that's blocking it. You're going to have to toss the victim card. And you're going to have to start applying spiritual mathematics and trust the process. And if you do, I can promise you the most satisfactory years lie ahead of you. So with that, Jimmy, I'm handing you the torch, brother. Thank you. Thank you, Harold. <clears throat> Love listening to you. Hi, everybody. I'm Jimmy. I'm an alcoholic. Grateful to be alive and sober and uh, come, from, come to you from the great state of New Jersey. Uh, very close to many of you. Uh, know many of you. I was very excited to see a bunch of you guys here tonight. Uh, I have a home group. It's called the Design for Living Group. I have a sponsor, service sponsor, sponsor a lot of guys. And i uh, been sober since my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and that was on March 28, 1987. Uh, and so it's really great to be here again with Harold and do this again. Uh, this, these two tonight are the big ones for me, uh, these two delusions, especially the first one I'm going to talk about, this uh, delusion that it's not my fault, it's victimization. And, you know, last week we talked a lot about, well, it was all about delusion of, you know, I'm not alcoholic. And this delusion of the victim that it's not my fault, I mean, that, that was my MO. How can I be alcoholic? 
It's your fault for my situations in my life. It's your fault for the relationships I have. It's your fault that I don't have money. It's your fault. It's your fault. It's your fault. It's your fault. And boy, did it take me a long time to get out of that, to, to get out of that mindset of that this victimization. I think what's really important is something that Harold said before. Uh, you know, we're not, it's really important to let you know that we're not downplaying any tra traumatic events in your life or condoning any certain behaviors. Um, you know, that's not what this is about. It's really about looking at my my role or my or my mistakes or my part in this this idea of victimization. You know, um, and again, this is probably my biggest one, and and there's a couple of reasons why. And, and one is, you know, this big trap. My emotional nature is always based on how you feel or how you treat me. My emotional nature is always based on how you feel or how you treat me. And what that looks like is like this. Um, I'm sad because of you. I'm happy because of you. Or you hurt my feelings. I mean, there's always a deflection to someone else, to blame someone else for the way I feel deep down inside. And, you know, you, a lot of you guys heard me speak. I mean, I've said, I've said this a million times and I say it jokingly, but the truth of the matter is, I truly believe this. You know, I always say I was born perfect and I was quickly handed over to two character defects called mom and dad. And no, that's kind of a, yeah, a little funny line and all like that. The truth of the matter is they were the ones that, that I blamed for everything, you know, uh, for growing up, for, you know, for everything that happened in my early years. Now, what I couldn't say, because my alcoholism doesn't come in a bottle, it comes in my mind, and my mind will always form these delusions, is that my parents, even though they gave me morals, values, good education, all these things, I took all that goodness that they tried to give me and I rolled it in a ball and I tried to stuff it right down their throat. You know, and I think that I had that moment like many of us have. I think I talked about this last week. I'm not even sure. But I think we all have that moment when life changes. And for me, it was like really early on, you know. I'm a kid like many of us, you know, I'm insecure, I'm filled with fear, I got a lot of anger going on, I have a lot of rage inside of me, uh, uh, but where do you take that stuff as a 10-year-old, 11-year-old, 12-year-old, what do you do with that kind of information? Uh, I come from a very uh, straight-laced type of family where you don't talk about how you feel, you don't say I love you, it's all that stuff that we hear all the time. But here I am, you know, my parents take me out of this uh, public school system and uh, pulled me away from my friends and they put me in a Catholic school system. And, you know, that doesn't make me an alcoholic, but what it did was it just exasperated all the deep feelings I had inside of me. And I started to blame them more and more and more. And, you know, very short after that, I picked up my first drink at the age of 13. You know, that other trap that I was falling is how I treat you and your reaction to me, right? Because a lot of this stuff is what I found out in the third step. You know, the way I play God in your life, the way I am the director of, you know, your life, you know, the conditions that I put on all the relationships that I have, you know, the expectations, the unreasonable demands that Bill talks about. And when you don't live up to the way I think you should, I'm the one who gets hurt. And then I'm the one who's the victim. And the problem with that is, you know, like I just said, you know, alcoholism comes in, the, comes in, the, doesn't come in a bottle, it comes in my mind. My mind will create all these scenarios. You know, when you have a mind that's filled with shame, guilt, and remorse, like like I had, and you know, you couple that with intense, intense, um, you know, emotions of jealousy, envy, self pity. But then you just couple that with the fact that I'm just a lazy type of guy. I'm expecting everything for free, and when I don't get it for free, you know, I, I become the victim, right? Not willing to do what you did in order to get what you got. I'm always looking for a handout. I have this sense of entitlement. I'm a guy that's jealous. I'm a guy that's envy of others all the time. So I always play that card of getting you to feel sorry for me because I'm the victim. And one of the big ones that happened for me, and the other thing with that too is, you know, when I'm drinking booze, this really, this really blows up that victimization. So I got a brother who's, you know, an older brother who was well off at one time. You know, I used to go to the well all the time looking for a handout. You know, he was a very smart guy. He was a chemist, became a chemistry teacher at Fordham University, went on to own his own pharmaceutical company. I mean, he was a guy that made a lot of money. And I would go to him 
and I bring my sad story to him about how I can't do this, how I can't do that. And I'll never forget this day, sitting in his backyard, he just looked at me and says, I'm done with you. And this hatred that came upon me, this role of the victim, how dare you treat me the way I'm doing after everything I've done? <laughs> I mean, it's kind of ridiculous when I even say that. But what I found out, and this is probably the most important thing about this, is that when I started to write inventory, I saw that I was living in a third column inventory. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you guys are familiar, and I know most of you all are familiar with, say, a four column inventory, that third column, the conflicts that Harold just thought about, the resentments, the reasons why I, I, I resent my brother, I resent her, I resent them, I resent everyone, you know, all those reasons in column two. And then how it affects me in column three, how it affects my self esteem, how it affects my pride my personal relationships, pocketbook, emotional security, my ambitions. What happens to a guy like me is I camp out in column three. You know, I, I build a case against you. It's where, you know, the ego and judgment lives free room and board. And see, you could have double digit sobriety tonight and it's not your fault because all I could see is how things are affecting me. And I can't see that fourth column that we'll eventually get to hopefully where I really start to see my mistakes. And how do I know that? Well, I lived in that third column for many years in sobriety, you know, and I sponsor enough men who I see fall into that victim role and live in that third column. I am so angry and I'm so, blame, uh, uh, you know, blaming others for the way I feel because I just can't let go and let God in my life. And I really see this delusion, and Harold said it before, you know, in the third and the fourth step. The third step, it says, Am I not the victim? Harold said it before. Am I not the victim of the delusion that I could force satisfaction and happiness out of this world if only I manage it right? If I can only get my ducks in a row, if you'll just do what I want you to do, I'll be okay. But the minute you don't do what I do, the minute you become the script violator, because we know what that guy is. I hand out scripts to everyone in my life. My wife, my kids, my ex-wife, my boss, my neighbors, my AA friends. And the minute that you don't do what I think you should do, well, guess what? Then I become the victim of that. In the fourth column or in the fourth step, it talks about that this world and its people were often quite wrong. To conclude that others were wrong was as far as most of us got. You know, so I'm always stuck in that third column. I'm always stuck with that feeling of how I always look at life through these dark lenses of how you're treating me. And I play that role of the victim. And the problem is with all this internal turmoil going on in my life, I'll always, you know, I'll always measure my spiritual progress with a material yardstick. So if I have a car, if I have money, if I have this, you know, all materialistic things, I think I'm going to be okay. So it was really important to me when I got into the steps, deeper into the steps, you know, that I started to really look at this from another angle. And the fourth step it talks about the key to face getting free of this is we went back through our lives, nothing counted but thoroughness and honesty. I found out it's really hard to be honest when you have to be right, right? Um, I distort the truth on everything because I want to be right. Like Harold or not really like Harold, Harold's story is a lot different than mine. I got daddy issues too. I think a lot of men my age, our age, in the 50s and 60s, have daddy issues. I blame my father for everything. That he did this, he did this. I had the laundry list of all the things my father never did for me. He never gave me an attaboy. He never gave me a hug. He never gave me, you know, the love that I thought I deserved. And I hated him at times. I blamed him. I fight with him. And what I couldn't see until I wrote inventory was truth. And the truth is my dad would have been 95 today. He comes from that generation. You know, that old generation, a lot of guys were Korean War vets. A lot of them had PS, P, PTSD or PSDD, whatever it is, you know. Uh, they didn't talk about their emotions. You know, the way my dad handled problems, he drank at them. My dad drank at every problem we ever had. Give me a drink, I'll take care of it. And I was living in the expectations or in an unreal world that this man should be able to just come up and hold me and put his arms around me and say, I love you. It took me a while to break that. But being right will never keep me happy. 
Matter of fact, being right will never keep me sober. Matter of fact, in that fourth step, it tells me that the victor only seems to win, that our moments of triumph are short-lived. So this idea that I have the upper hand because I'm the victim is the delusion of all delusions, that I had to get that smashed. It goes on to talk about this was our course. We realized something that we never realized before. I realized something on a level of internally that I never knew. I realized something deep down in my soul, not in my mind, but in my soul, that the people who, uh, that the people who wronged me or the people I had conflicts were perhaps spiritually sick, just like me. This was the thing that freed me from the victimization is by looking at this from a different angle. When I started to look at people that might, might be perhaps spiritually sick, I started to see some truth. Now, one of the things I knew about myself was I'm pretty sick. I'm a spiritually sick guy. I'm disconnected from God. I have wedges between me and you. But when I was able to look at you and see the same thing, you see, the whole planet is sick, really. Just put the news on for 10 minutes. We all have spiritual problems. We're all spiritually dis disconnected at times. But what my sponsor at the time had me do was, he said, Jimmy, look at all these reasons why you're in conflict. Look at all the things why you hate people, or you're resentful. I want you to do an exercise. In order to get out of column three, I need you to go back into column two and ask yourself a real simple question. Did you ever do this behavior? Hmm, that's kind of odd. Why would I do that? But I follow orders. And I started to go through every resentment and every conflict I had. All the things that I think make me the victim of my circumstances. And I started one by one saying that I do the same things that you do. I, see that I do the same things that my dad does. I see that I do the same things as my wife does, my ex-wife, my kids. I do all the same things that I resent. And I started to see some spiritual truth in my life for the first time. Rather than playing the victim, what I started to see is that I need to start forgiving others. And I need to start being compassionate for others. And I need to start looking at this from a different angle. You see, we all have bad hair spiritual days. You know, I've had a lot, so I had no hair. But the fact of the matter is, is it possible that the people in my life who have no program of action like we do tonight, that they react in certain ways when they're afraid? Absolutely. Is it possible that the people in my life who have no program of action like we have here tonight react certain ways when they're angry or when they're selfish or when they're jealous or when they're envious? And I started to think about this and I started to be, be more compassionate to them. And I started to be give more forgiving because you see, I'm trying to get forgiven for my sins. Am I willing to forgive someone else's? And it's in those actions that I started to get free from this victimization role, that it's not my fault. And I got to stop living up to these expectations, expecting you to do things for me to make me feel okay. And when I was able to start seeing that and start doing that, things started to get different. I don't think any of us have, are immune to this, this delusion of victimization. Uh, I think we need each other to talk about this stuff. I think this is why it's so important to have a sponsor when I feel like this, that I can go to him and talk about really what's going on inside and see some spiritual truth. Because what this does is just bleeds me into the second thing that Harold talked about, that my time has come and gone. Why try? Why try? How many people are sitting here right now, like Harold said, that want to go back to school, but they're not going to go back to school? Why try? How many people are sitting here right now, disconnected from your family, not seeing your kids in years, have no contact with anyone in your family? Why try? What's the use? How many people are sitting here tonight? I'm not going to apply for that job. I'll never get it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go down and do an interview. I'll never get it. Why try? What's the use? How many people are sitting here tonight too afraid to put their hand up in a homeroom or a home group and maybe take that position as the coffee maker or the greeter or a GSR or some other position in the group because what's the use? They're not going to pick me. And we sit around in AA and we sit around in life and we have this defeatist attitude, right? 
and it just blends into this victimization. Why would anyone help me? You know, I start to rationalize behaviors. I start to justify my behaviors. What's the use? You know, one of the things I had to see was how I'm built. And inventory showed me how I'm built. I walked in here, you know, you know, at the age of 29 years old, 34 years ago. And I'm a guy that walked in like a three-year-old, filled with insecurities, filled with fear, filled with rage and anger, under the delusion that if I just don't drink, everything will just magically disappear. Five years without a drink, I need, I got a rope. I just need a bridge to jump off because I'm dying of this stuff. I'm dying of this untreated alcoholism. That's what it really is in the long run. It's just untreated alcoholism that's eating my lunch on a daily basis. So I became willing to start going into the darkness of my life. Harold talks about in his manuscript about the discouraged heart. I'm always in a state of restless, irritable, discontent, restless, feeling uneasy, irritable, easily annoyed at everything. Discontent, never satisfied, but discontent has another, re another definition. I can't experience joy in anything because I'm always the victim. And what's the use anyhow, right? And you can't have joy with a discouraged heart. That's what I found out in here because I have this defeatist attitude that I don't deserve anything. Now, God has taken me to a place that I could never... It's amazing how God has can take me, give me sobriety. God can give me a life, and I could still fall into that old thinking. I think Bill writes one of the greatest paragraphs in our book. We hear it all the time. Every time we go to a meeting, somebody reads chapter five. It says, "At some of these we bought, we thought we could find an easier, softer way, but we could not. With all the earnestness at our command, we beg you to be fearless and thorough from the very start." Some of us have tried to hold on to our old ideas, and the result was nil until we let go, absolutely. Why can't I let go? Why am I afraid to change? Why am I afraid to look at this stuff? I think it comes down to one word, pride. Pride. Harold and Peter did a, a, seven, deadly, a seven Deadly Sins workshop not too long ago, and the whole emphasis was on this word pride. See, my pride is the essence of my self-centeredness. And my pride is the thing that will justify every character defect in me. It's the, it's, the, it's the leader of the band. And see, pride doesn't want me to look at anything. Pride wants me to wallow in this crap. Pride wants me, my alcoholism wants me dead, but will settle for me drinking. And see, that's what this does. So we fall into that dark place that Harold talks about a lot. And when you live in the darkness, it just kills your spirit because it's always someone else's fault for the way I feel. I'm never good enough. I can't take chances. I can't try. I can't raise my hand. I just become a shell of the person that I am. My life should look a certain way. And when I really examine my life in all areas of my life, whether it's relationships, work, money, uh, AA, uh, my life should look a certain way in all those areas. And the second that my life doesn't look the way I think it should look, it creates the attitudes and the emotions that many of us walk around with. That's the power of these old ideas. So I got to start examining these old ideas and these old delusions. You know, it's a lot easier, but it's a tough hole to climb out of. But the moment I start to see light, the moment that I start to put spiritual actions into my life, I start to get results, you know, and that's the gift. And that's the good news that we can climb out of the hole we're in with all these delusions. All I got to really do is be willing. So really it takes about an examination of some really important things. How does discouragement show up in my mind? I need to really inventory that. How does discouragement really show up in my physical being, in my relationships? I really need to take a look at that. How does discouragement really show up in my spirit, my relationships with God, all these things that are blocking me from freedom? Am I willing to walk into the darkness to find the light? Am I really willing to walk into darkness to be at peace? Am I really willing to walk into darkness to let go of these fears? You know, I say it all the time, you know, alcoholism is like a big, oh, alcohol synonymous, like a big bonfire. 
And a lot of people are walking around the fire with these delusions, trying to stay warm, but eventually the fire is gonna burn out. What the old timers used to say is that if you really wanna change, if you really wanna let go, if you really wanna let go of these delusions and really have a life, you gotta walk through that fire and get your ass burnt and feel the uncomfortability of change. You see, what somebody could never do for me and I can't do for anyone here is give you willingness. How great does the pain have to get before I start to take actions? You know, I do an exercise with all my guys. I don't know, I've been doing it for years. Started at the new year. It's called intentions. Pretty simple. I am statements. We look at the mind and we look at the body. We look at the spirit. And we start to bring this intentions into our prayer life. So I look at my mind. I am reading more books. Thank you, God. Every statement ends with thank you, God. I am, uh, you know, looking for, I am, I am going back to school. Thank you, God. Start putting this positive stuff back into the universe. I am starting to go back to the gym, take care of my body. Thank you, God. I am eating healthy. Thank you, God. My spirit, I am praying more on a daily basis. I am meditating more. I'm writing more inventory on a daily basis. Thank you, God. And it's amazing when you start to put this stuff back into the universe and take actions, even though, like Harold said it and Clancy said it all the time, even though we don't believe in this stuff's going to work for a guy like me. And that's the gift, because it does work. I just need to be willing. So these two are really, for me, uh, the big ones. Uh, it's so easy to fall into that victim role, you know, playing God. Wow. Book tells me I got to quit playing God. Why? Second shortest line in the whole book. It doesn't work. But the moment that I let God be God and let him to be the director of my life, the moment that I do the job that he's asking me to do because he's the principal and I'm the agent, the moment that I start helping others like he really expects me to, like a good father or like a good grandfather who takes care of their children or their grandchildren, if I do the things that God wants me to do by helping his kids, he'll take care of me. He'll give me everything I need. I just got to let go of a lot of these old ideas. And I got to really start examining my life and be more willing to walk through the darkness of my life, especially when I don't see hope. Because that's the other thing we sell here. We sell hope. That no matter how delusional or how much trouble or all the negativity that's going on, there's always hope. All I got to be is willing and grab another man like Harold or anyone else on here and just say, listen, I got a problem that I need to talk about. Maybe you could help me. And the minute that I start to do that, I open up that door. The door of the sick mind opens from the inside. And the minute I start to walk through that door, I start to get free. Because that's the deal here. We're really shooting for freedom. Freedom from the bondage of me. Freedom from this delusional mind, freedom from all the things that are blocking me from being successful, happy, and really just uh, enjoy sobriety the way it's supposed to be. So Harold, I'll kick it back to you, Big Mo in Big Co. Congratulations. I'll be the first to say congratulations, Grandpa. Thanks, Jimmy. And uh, thanks. You know, it was just beautiful, Jimmy. That was great. Fantastic. Loved it. And uh, made me think about a lot of things. And you know, as we close out, you know, one thing that we, we we'll probably hit on a little bit in the next couple of weeks is, you know, eight, nine and, and how that helped. That's such a, you know, a magical part of this whole thing and clearing that channel. And, and, uh, and, and that's where the impossibility really seems impossible to that, you know, where you're, there's just so much debris and so much damage left over from the wreckage that this seems like it'll never come back together. And, you know, a, a, just a quick story to close this out, but what I will tell you is that, you know, that dad that I told you about that inventory, um, when I was writing my A-step list, and this is where the delusion gets into, you know, our A-step list big time. And they'll tell us that so much of this stuff's at a subconscious level. We don't even know. You won't even see it for what it is. And this is where we got to redouble our efforts. But right away, my sponsors were going through this. He goes, well, what about your dad's brother? And I said, well, what about him? He goes, how come he's not on your list? I said, dude, I only saw the guy one time when I was like five or six. I mean, I don't know that guy anything. He says, well, you ever been a part of his life, Harold? I said, never. But he's the adult. I'm the kid. If you want to be a part of my life, he'd been, see, this is where the delusion comes in. He would, he would have already done something. He would have took some action. He says, well, how do you know? He and so I, I fought it. 
He says, put him down. It was my Uncle Bob. So I put Uncle Bob down. For 12 years, friend, I had a stack of three by five index cards. For 12 years, Uncle Bob went to the back every time he came up. I had no desire. This is how deep that delusion was. And at 12 years sobriety, my little stack of cards got real small, and I only had a few left, and Uncle Bob was one of them. It was Christmas time. And I don't even know if the guy's still alive. So I Google Robert and Betty Long, poop, Buffalo, Missouri. I said, well, that's got to be my Uncle Bob. Ozark Mountains, it's got to be him. Sent him a quick Christmas card, little synopsis of my life, why I was reaching out to him. And immediately, my Aunt Betty wrote a card back, and I still got it today. It's in my big book. And uh, she was just overwhelmed to hear from me. And, and then she called me a day or two later just to make sure I got it. And, and, I, and I, they called me Little Harold. I guess that's what they called me when I was a little kid because my dad's name was Harold. They said, well, Little Harold, we're just glad to hear from you. I said, well, Aunt Betty, I really need to come and see you so I can make this amends in person. She goes, well, I don't know about all that amends stuff, but we'll welcome you to come. And so I drove, you know, we set it up and, and it was about three and a half hours to, to Buffalo, Missouri. And I drove and I hadn't seen these people since I was five or six. So this is 30 plus years later. I, I don't know any of these people, but I drove and there's a great promise in the book. And it says that nine times out of 10, the unexpected is going to happen when it comes to this. Thing. And this is where the impossible becomes possible. So I drove to Buffalo, Missouri. And in this, in this mind that Jimmy talked so well about, tried to, you know, interrogate me and, and, and demoralize me and, and shatter this, 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 this hope of reconciliation before I ever got there. But I pull up on Locust Street in Buffalo, Missouri, one o'clock in the afternoon, we're going to have lunch together. Little country town, about 3,000 people. I pull down their little road, I pull into their double driveway. There's three cars, one spot for me. And there's all kinds of cars out on the, on the road on this one-way street. And I thought, man, these old people got a lot of cars, man. And uh, I pull in there. I'm a nervous wreck. I get out of the car. And my Aunt Betty comes down the front porch. She's just a small country lady. And she looks at me with a big old country smile. And she hollers back into the house, well, he looks like a long. You know, I'm just a nervous wreck. And, and I walk up there. And my Uncle Bob comes out. I'll never forget it. He come out. And he looked me right in the eyes. And he shook my hand. He shook my hand. He says, welcome home, son. I want you to come inside. I got some people I want you to meet. And I walked into this house and every one of his kids and grandkids and several cousins, about 30 something people were in that house to welcome me back into their life. And I've never been apart from them ever since. It's been an amazing ride. That's how powerful the stuff we're talking about. That's the delusion that we're talking about. And, uh, and I know there's plenty of Uncle Bob stories on there. I could give you many more of those scenarios that came out of steps eight and nine, but that's what I'm talking about. So with that, I'll pass it back to you our chairperson who did a wonderful job getting us here. And that's it. I, I pass it out. Thanks, Jimmy. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and Harold, you almost made me cry there. I had to hold it back. And I've heard that story before about, about Uncle Bob. So listen, I'm going to open the chat. We've come to